Coming up on DTNS, Tim Stevens tells us what to expect from electrical vehicles in 2021. Google employees try to unionize. And can CES work as a virtual event? This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, January 4th, 2021. In Los Angeles, I'm Todd Merritt. And from Studio Redwood adjacent, I'm Sarah Lane. And living slightly in the past is Roger Chang, the show's producer. Uh, also joining us, as you just heard, uh, Editor-in-Chief, CNET Roadshow, Tim Stevens. Uh, welcome back. I, I love kicking off the new year with you on Daily Tech News Show every year. I, I love it, too. Thanks so much for having me. This is a, a great tradition. It's been a great, uh, what do we say, seven years now? So uh, congratulations yeah. on all the amazing stuff you've done over that time. It's really been great to watch. Oh, thank you, Ben. It's 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 always good to have you. We should have you on the rest of the year. We shouldn't limit it. Uh, but I know everybody gets busy. And, you got and, my number, and, man. I mean, yeah, I know, I know. We'll 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 make it happen this year. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's uh, uh, let people know uh, if you want to hear more of us chatting uh, about what we were doing over the holidays, some of the tech stuff we might have gotten. Get that wider conversation. Good day, internet. Patreon.com/slash/dtns. Let's start the new year with a few tech things you should know. UK judge Vanessa Baritzer of Westminster Magistrates Courts ruled that WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange cannot be extradited to the United States to face trial on charges of violating the Espionage Act. The judge ruled that extradition would be unjust and oppressive, citing that Assange's mental health would put him at extreme risk of suicide if extradited to the U.S., the judge rejected Assange's defense that the charges were an attack on press freedom, saying that the U.S. brought the case in good faith. In 2019, Assange was charged with 17 counts of violating the Espionage Act, resulting from the publication of documents provided by former U.S. Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning. TechCrunch sources say the Indian social network ShareChat is in advanced talks on a new funding round that it would include new investors Google and Snap as well as an additional investment from Twitter, who already invested in them before. Uh, this Series E round would reportedly be more than $200 million, Google investing a bunch. Uh, executives at ShareChat have said it's growing exponentially with its short video app Moj, M-O-J, having 80 million monthly active users as of September 2019. While Quibi shut down its streaming service last year, it had a short life, but you know, RIP Quibi, its content may live on. The Wall Street Journal sources say that the company is nearing a deal with Roku for its content catalog. Quibi's content would reportedly be added to Roku's free ad-supported Roku channel streaming service. Whoever had the uh, bet that there'd be a Quibi story to lead off 2021, you just cashed it big. Yep, good bingo. Uh, research note by analyst Ming-Chi Kuo, obtained by Mac Rumors, says Apple may debut its yet unreleased AirTags item trackers. Quo's like, no, this time it's really going to happen. Uh, previously rumored augmented reality device is going to be coming this year. A few other things in 2021. Quo also noted new AirPods, more Apple Silicon Max, which I think we all expect, and Apple's first devices with mini LED displays uh, are among the new products Quo expects. Well, as far as products that probably are real, Samsung sent out invites to its latest Galaxy Unpacked event on January 14th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, taglined, Welcome to the Everyday Epic. The teaser video appears to show a smartphone camera module. Good thing there wasn't a common there, or it would be like a, a tease at, at Epic Games. Welcome to the Everyday. <laughs> You're right, Epic. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's get to talking about that big story of January 4th, 2021, unionization in tech. Around 227 Alphabet workers have announced they are joining together in an effort with the Communication Workers of America to form a union at Google for both full-time employees as well as contractors. The organization's efforts will be chaired by Google software engineers Parul Kool and Chewy Shaw, with union representatives, of course, to eventually be elected by the members. In a New York Times op-ed announcing the union, Kool and Shaw cited Google's contract with the Pentagon to use AI in Project Maven, the firing of AI researcher Timnit Gebru, and forced arbitration for claims of sexual harassment as alphabet management ignoring the concerns of the workers. Those are their examples. They also emphasized the need to bring benefits to contract workers and the payout packages that executives got uh, when they were accused of sexual harassment. Previous tech industry unionization efforts include Kickstarter and Glitch, uh, Google contractors, with HCL technology in Pittsburgh are also unionized. Tech company cafeteria workers in the Bay Area are unionized. So this has been a growing movement, but this is by far the biggest effort yet. 
The U.S. National Labor Relations Board filed a complaint against Google in December regarding interfering with employees' rights to organize, uh, which could loosen things up a little bit, but that was maybe a signal that this was coming. The next step for the Alphabet union effort is to get recognition from Alphabet. You go to the company and say, hey, will you recognize our union efforts? Now, the company can voluntarily do that uh, or force it to have an election, which is what Kickstarter did. And that Kickstarter union took about 10 months to get recognized because of that. However, the Alphabet Union is not seeking federal ratification through the NLRB. That means they're not going for collective bargaining rights, which is maybe a little less adversarial. We'll see how Google reacts to that. If successful, the Alphabet Union would become part of CWA Local 1400. Alphabet told several press outlets, quote, We'll continue engaging directly with all our employees, which I interpreted to mean we're still figuring out how to respond to this. Uh, big, big deal here, yeah? Yeah, it's a big deal. I mean, when you you mentioned Kickstarter and the fact that there was some success there as far as unionization, Alphabet is not that kind of company. Uh, Alphabet is a big ass company and the fact that a very small amount of alphabet workers at least on you know on record are saying we want to do this is one thing but uh the, i don't know i i feel like sure the company will figure out what's best for the company but based on what it's gone through over the last year uh, and, you know, years prior as far as being, you know, too big to fail type of a thing. The idea that the company would push back on employees who have, in many cases, pretty good reasons to say, here's some discrimination stuff that we've faced. Here's where the company has not listened to employees that we've uh, made note of. And here's why we think this is a good idea for the benefit of the people who are keeping this company going has a lot of merit. Yeah, for sure. I t <clears throat> totally agree, Sarah. I don't think that Google really has any leg to stand on when it comes to pushing back on this. There's been so much negative PR uh, around all the moves that you mentioned, Tom, uh, just seemingly very short-sighted initiatives at Google and, and changes in, in policies that have been really negatively reacted internally and externally. Uh, and, you know, I've been a manager for a long time now at a lot of different companies, some of which are unionized and which are not. And, and this is always kind of the, the final symptom of a company that's that's not listening to or not able to react to their employees and, and ultimately you know this step it's to me it's kind of sad not that employees are taking power i think that's a good thing but it's sad that that they had to take this step to do so um because this you know this may help bring more people to the table when they're having discussions about these sorts of issues um, but ultimately it's going to formalize things and, and potentially slow things down quite a bit more um, so I do hope that there is a positive resolution out of this. I do hope that, if nothing else, uh, Google officers are standing up a little bit more straight in these negotiation meetings going forward. Um, but ultimately, it, it is kind of sad that, that that Google wasn't able to open those lines of communication in a, in a better, more more friendly way that they had to kind of take this step. Uh, that's, that's a bit unfortunate. Yeah, this is precedent setting, too. Uh, how this plays out will, will sort of set the tone for a lot of other companies uh, that have been talking about, the employees of those companies anyway, talking about whether they should unionize, the need to unionize. Uh, Kickstarter was, was the first to go and sort of, I think, got people talking about whether they could or should. Uh, this is going to say, how difficult will it be? Uh, this, this will show you what you could expect. And, and from both the employee side as well as the, the company side, uh, Facebook, Amazon, uh, you know, there's a lot of unionization talk around Amazon are going to look at this and say, OK, how do they react uh, and, and when they react? What effect does it have and what can we learn from that uh, in the future? And I hope that the learnings internally aren't just about how do we handle our employees wanting to unionize, but there's also some learnings about how do we teach our employees to be better managers. You know, we're looking at Google, which is still a very young company that's grown, you know, exponentially hugely over the past couple of years. And so you have a lot of people who are fairly inexperienced managing, you know, a lot of people doing a lot of things. Uh, and ultimately, I think that, that that's probably where you need to look to find a lot of the issues that that, that these employees are, are trying to fix and feeling forced to go into the union because ultimately they weren't able to get the communication open, they weren't able to get what they needed, that their managers ultimately were letting them down. And that's a very unfortunate thing. So, you know, definitely, I, I think Google's going to have some very important steps and decisions to make as they recognize the immunization of their employees. But I hope that other companies don't just look at how Google reacts to the formation of the union, but they also look back six months, 12 months, 
and you know 24 months at all the missteps that were made along the way so that they can train their employees a little bit better about how to make sure that everyone is feeling like they have a seat at the table. Well, let's talk about Windows. How do we all feel about Windows? <laughs> a job, a job. Right I'm a union. I don't do Windows. Oh, wait. No, different story. Yeah. Well, you might after this story. A job listing for a software engineering role at Microsoft's Windows core user experience team referred to a, quote, sweeping visual rejuvenation of Windows experiences to signal to our customers that Windows is back. The reference to sweeping visual rejuvenation was later removed, but it was there initially. The posting seems to confirm what Windows Central sources said back in October about a planned UI overhaul code named Sun Valley, which would update the start menu, the action center, the file explorer, and built-in apps to make the UI more consistent, as well as provide better tablet optimizations. Sun Valley is reportedly scheduled to ship as part of Windows 10 Cobalt in Q4 of this year, 2021. The rejuvenation reportedly isn't a completely refreshed UI, rather a more consistent application of Microsoft's existing Fluent design. Yeah, uh, I mean, we could get caught up into why they decided sweeping visual rejuvenation shouldn't be in that job description. I'm, I'm sure that really sounds like plastic surgery. I don't know. It's just a funny I, way. To... Yeah, it may be some <laughs> expectation setting uh, involved in there or or whatever. But I, I think no matter what, uh, all this stuff, the the leaks back in October and and this job posting point to that the fact that since. Uh, Panos Panay took over in, in October last year, Windows is focused on on tightening things up uh, and, and, and kind of finally getting out of that Windows 8 awkward phase that it had where it was kind of trying to be a tablet OS, but also a desktop OS at the same time. And I, and I think all Windows users uh, would like that, would like them to, to finally get that, that nice and streamlined. So I, I'm, I'm positive about this. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm as well. I'm a Windows user. I'm using Windows right now. And I, I think the Pentos has a really great eye for design in general. So I think that'll help. But really, all that I want is better integration. As you mentioned, Tom, it's always been this kind of, you know, they made a really big push to try to make Windows tablet friendly. And then they realized that ultimately, really, there weren't that many consumers using Windows on a tablet anyway. So they rolled a lot of that back. And now you've got this sort of thing where you've you try to change your audio settings, for example, you kind of get this really simple tabletified version, but if you actually want to do anything serious and you have to hop over to the control panel, which looks suddenly like old windows. Um, if all I get out of this is a, a single unified control panel that is easy to use, that hasn't, doesn't have me jumping around five different places to enable my network adapter, uh, I'll be very happy. I really don't care what it looks like. Yeah, I think sweeping visual rejuvenation is probably overstating. Uh, we're going to make all the settings panel look the same, which I don't know, maybe yeah. why they decided to, you know, and maybe it does mean that to a UX op uh, designer, right? Like, oh, yeah, that's mm. a sweeping rejuvenation. Whereas to us, it's like, no, that's just something we wish you would have yeah, done a long like, time like, ago. Yeah, like made some yeah. circle squares. It's cool, though. Uh, I'm looking forward yeah. to it. Yeah. And this was a job they posting, make... so they got to kind of make it sound interesting. You know, they were trying to attract right, talents here, so yeah. it's not just and us. They're, 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 they're well. speaking to you. UX people, right? right? You're speaking in UXEs. Well, a new year might mean some new form factors uh, for technology. Tom's Guide passing along a report from Taiwanese United Daily News that Apple uh, reportedly commissioned two prototype shells from Foxconn for foldable displays. Now, this is a, a, a very low reliability source. Also, even if it's true, it just means that Apple commission some prototypes doesn't mean they're even going to do this, but uh, one would be a book-like design like the Surface Duo and the other a more standard smartphone design that would fold in half, kind of like uh, the Motorola Razr or, or the, the Samsung foldable phone. A December 31st Apple patent filing also shows a device that folds both in and out, kind of a combination of the Galaxy Z Flip and the Huawei Mate X. Uh, so, yeah, there could be something in the works. I'm sure it'll be a long time if and when we ever see it, but that's interesting to note. And Google doesn't want to be left out. They've got an FCC filing showing they plan to expand the devices that use radar-based solely technology. Unlike a patent, an FCC filing means we're trying to get this product approved. It's a real product. Uh, the filing details a new interactive device with a screen that supports a 60 gigahertz frequency used by Soli, along with Zigbee smart home protocols. It's not clear if this will be another Google Home product or a Nest secure successor or an entirely new product line. Uh, Soli first debuted on the Pixel 4 
and was added to the new Nest thermostat back in October. And back in September, Google's Rick Osterloh told The Verge that despite Sully not being included in the Pixel 5, it would be, quote, used in the future. So apparently the future is now. Well, I mean, earlier in the show, we talked about Ming-Chi Kuo's uh, uh, ideas of what Apple is going to come up with this year. I think Apple is really focused on those M1 and M1 successor chips for a variety of products. There may be some AR stuff that we're seeing. A foldable device, probably not happening anytime soon. But I'm sure the company is working on it like other companies are. Tim, I know normally around this time of year, we'd all be packing up for CES to look at some foldable devices that may or may not be vaporware. <laughs> Is there anything that stands out to you as, as, as really becoming a front runner going forward? As far as foldable devices go, um, yeah, it, it still seems like early days. You know, I still, even though we're on, you know, Gen two or even Gen three in some of these products, it still feels like we are kind of in the beta testing phase to see. Uh, how you know what the longevity of these is like, how people are going to use them. Uh, I think it's fascinating technology that everybody wants because it it just seems so futuristic. But I mean, reading the story before we came on, you know, I, I remember back when I used to run a gadget a hundred years ago, all of the the supposed leaked uh, pictures of folding iPhones and things like that that we used to laugh at because they were so preposterous at the time. You know, we knew it was coming at some point, and I still, you know, it, it seems inevitable, but it still feels like we're at least a year or two away from an actual folding iPhone. So I think it's great, but I still think it's right now toys for very early adopters. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to that first truly mainstream foldable device um, because I, I want to own one. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, Apple traditionally has been the one that that comes to the category when it's ready, not, right. not when it's early. Uh, and so if this bore out and in a couple of years we did get a foldable iPhone, it'd be a huge deal. And everybody would talk about, oh, this is a real category now. Uh, that said, I, I, I'm a little more bullish on foldable than I was. Uh, I feel like we're finally with the Galaxy Z Flip particularly, we're getting we're getting form factors that people look at and want. Whether they can afford them or not is a whole different situation right now, right? But but I, I, I see them in TV shows and movies now, and I, I feel like people are like, oh, that's kind of cool. Maybe Maybe I would like that. Uh, if the price came down, yeah. Uh, as far yeah, as Google and Sully goes, yeah, yeah. I, th I think Google, I think Google uh, is not going to abandon motion detection. It's just trying to find a home for it. So we'll see what they come up with. Yeah, I hope so. I, I think Sully technology has huge potential. Uh, you know, and I think actually it would work really well on a smart home device because if you think about the interfaces on on these things with small displays or, or even no display, it's kind of hard to you going between a thermostat and you know smart lights that kind of thing. The ability to control these with gestures and more advanced gestures could actually be really interesting. So I hope they can figure that out. Hey, folks, join in the conversation about all this stuff. What's your favorite form factor? Tell us in the Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Well, we hear the term EV all the time, especially when it relates to cars, electric vehicles becoming more and more mainstream. And with Tim Stevens on the show with us today, we just couldn't not mine his brain about what kind of EV trends we may see in 2021 or beyond. So, Tim... What is coming down the road? Oh, lots of good stuff. You know, it seems like every year, next year is going to be the big year for EVs. But, you know, I really feel like 2021 is going to be the year where we see a lot of really interesting products come to market that people can really, you know, feel good about purchasing. We just talked about how foldable displays are approaching mainstream, but you still have some compromises there when it comes to cost and durability. We're kind of getting past that point with EV now where EVs are approaching the same price as a normal car. They have range in excess of 200 miles, which is the point where you can kind of stop having range anxiety. And cars that look good and are fun to drive. Uh, I'm really bullish this year about Ford's Mach-E. Um, that was the, the product that, that made a lot of people angry last year because they called it a Mustang. A lot of people were saying, well, it's a crossover SUV. It can't be a Mustang. But I hope that everyone's moved past that because this looks like a really good entry into the EV market. Um, prices starting in the thirty dollars to $40,000 range, uh, ranges uh, of EV battery life upwards approaching 300 miles, uh, still falling short of what Tesla offers. Um, but in a car that you can go and theoretically buy at any Ford dealership, get serviced at any Ford dealership. Uh, and ultimately, that just looks, in my opinion, like a really nice crossover SUV. So products like that come to market uh, make me really bullish about EVs in 2021. 
Yeah, are, are these, you know, a lot of these, especially like the Maki or the or the the Volvo are are high-end vehicles where I think a lot of folks are out there saying like, "Okay, that's great. I'm glad we have a lot of these now. We're not just looking at one or two, but when are we going to get a, a you know, a boring sedan uh <laughs> EV that I could afford?" Yeah, we're still waiting on that because the cost of a battery pack is still substantial to the point where we're adding, uh, you know, between five and ten thousand dollars over the cost of just a standard, you know, economy sedan or economy hatchback. So there are cars on the market now, like the Chevrolet Bolt or the Tesla Model Three, of course, um, that offer the same kind of uh, practicality of uh, a normal hatchback, uh, but ultimately they're still costing again between five and ten grand more. And ultimately, I think we're still a ways away from being able to um, to change that. Tesla's promising they've got new battery cells coming called a 4860 cell, uh, which will allow them to add more energy density and kind of take some of the, the the surrounding materials out of the individual batteries. And there are you know thousands of small batteries inside of your average Tesla. If they can drive the cost down of those individual cells, they can theoretically make those cars more affordable. And so hopefully narrow that gap uh, of cost between, let's say, a Model 3 and something like a Toyota Corolla. Um, but those are unfortunately still years away. So I think we're still going to see a lot of the momentum in the you know high thirty thousand to sixty thousand dollar range. But remember, the average cost of a new car in the U.S. is around thirty six, thirty seven thousand dollars. So that's actually kind of hitting that sweet spot with a car like the Chevrolet Bolt or something like the Volkswagen ID four or some of the new Hondas that are coming to this market as well. So we're not actually that far off. But yeah, there's still definitely a strong need for cheaper EVs. Those we may have to wait for another year. You know, as a, a person who drives a Volvo XC60, um, the idea of getting a recharge, um, even the 40, which is a lovely car also, I yeah. mean, I am I am a big fan. However, we're still kind of in that point where, sure, charging stations are becoming more uh, common, uh, especially, you know, if you're living in California and you're on the five, it used to be like there was one place where you could do it. Now there are many, but it kind of has to become this ubiquitous thing that's like gas. Because as a renter, I don't own my home. I can't plug in my car. Where am I going to plug in my car? Lots of people have that issue. Like, that sounds great. But unless you have a certain setup at home, you can't really do this. So you have to have the equivalent of gas stations around so that you feel like you can be mobile and never have to worry about running out of steam. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, half of the equation of range anxiety is how far can I go in my car on a charge? But the other half is, of course, where can I charge this thing? Uh, for people who own their own home, you know, the solution is pretty easy. You come home, you plug it in at night, and then you're probably pretty good. Or if you happen to work somewhere that has a charger at work, which is becoming increasingly common, if you can charge it up while you're in the office during the day, then that may solve the issue as well. Um, but that's definitely something that, that we need to see more charging stations, if only to give people that peace of mind. You know, we, we've seen studies in Japan, for example, in the early, early days of EVs where Nissan uh, gave out Leafs, or, or excuse me, it was Mitsubishi that gave out IMES, which was one of the early EVs, which had a very short range, you know, in the order of 50 or 60 miles. And people just weren't using them because they didn't feel comfortable. Uh, Mitsubishi put in a lot of chargers and suddenly people were suddenly using their cars a lot more but they actually weren't using those chargers. They were just kind of like a safety blanket that people felt that they needed. Um, so th there's going to be a lot of changing of thinking of how you attack your car, You know that I don't necessarily need to, to charge it up, that I have a gas station in my garage effectively if you happen to own your own home. Um, but there's a lot of infrastructure that's still needed and a lot of, a lot of frankly, marketing that's needed as well to, to make people see the advantages of owning an EV, uh, not just kind of the penalties or the environmental implications. Well, folks, CES set to kick off January 11th. It's an open question how the CTA is going to pull off the biggest product show of the year as a virtual event, certainly the biggest product show in the U U.S. anyway. Uh, the show will feature a lot of familiar companies. AMD CEO Dr. Lisa Su will deliver a keynote, as will Verizon CEO Hans Vestberg. Uh, LG uh, already out there talking about their mini LED-based uh, TVs, OLEDs that curve. Uh, for gaming, but that can stay flat for regular TV watching. A uh, thousand millimeter radius and variable refresh rate from 40 to 120 hertz. Uh, they've got a bunch of transparent OLED uh, cases. Uh, we've we've been to our fair share of CESs. Can a virtual CES have the same impact as a product show? Tim, what do you think? I think that for the vast majority of people reading media, every CES is virtual. I mean, I mean, they're, they're kind of watching along with us. We're hopefully doing a good job of, of bringing people to the show as best we can. But ultimately, people are, are watching this stuff on, on YouTube or wherever, um, getting getting their tech news and kind of following along virtually. So for the consumers, theoretically, it doesn't have to change that much. 
But obviously, if we're talking, like you said, about some you know new massive OLED that that curves, it, it's a little bit hard to sample that if you're not going somewhere to see it. Um, so you know, I can't say too much, but certainly I'm aware of of colleagues who are receiving very large boxes in the mail. So I think we'll still see some of the interesting coverage that we typically see out of CES. It just won't be quite as grandiose as we've seen in the past. But frankly, I think the news is still going to be very exciting. And if anything, you know. Being able to cover this stuff from home, I think, will give we we people in the media an opportunity to kind of cover this in a little bit more healthy way, uh, not be staying up till 1 or 2 a.m. going to various conferences that people schedule very late or, or having meetings with people over <laughs> dinner or maybe going yes. out to the buffet at 3 a.m. You know, if anything, I think this will be uh, an easier CES for us to cover, which means, I think, probably better uh, coverage for the readers in, in the long run. I hope anyway. But what about all the parties you get invited to that you just you know get to <laughs> schmooze with people you would that never I, rub I shoulders never go with? To. I think I've been to maybe one CES party uh, in the many many moons that I've been going to, to CES. That, that's that's something that's never really appealed to I me mean, that much. But one of us, one of us. Yeah, I know. But but <laughs> that that's it, where it, you that's where you do though. get people finding out stuff though, right? Even yeah. if it's not you or me. Uh, you, that is where somebody later says, like, well, I was talking at a party to this executive who said blah, 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 blah. So you're not going to have that kind of stuff happening. Right. Uh, you're not going to have the I got my hands on it at the CES show floor. And here's what I noticed. Uh, but if you as you mentioned, if some of these products are being shipped out to select journalists, they're also going to be able to put their hands on them in a way that they wouldn't on the show floor. They're going to get more time with them. They're going to not have somebody looking over their shoulder, kind of directing them, you know, this way or that. So it's it's going to be a different kind of coverage, because yes, uh, I've covered CES virtually before in my life, but I was always relying on the reporting from the people who were there. This time, nobody is going to be there, and I, th I think that is a fundamental difference. I don't think it'll mean bad coverage. I think it'll just mean different coverage. I, yeah, I, I think mean, I think you're right, Tom. The whole idea of seeing a curved OLED for gaming that is also flat for regular TV watching, I'm like, that sounds awesome. I got to see this. And when you're there, even though in the past, you know, for the last few years, DTNS is, you know, we're kind of in our little media box in the back and, you know, we're able to scour the floor when we have time, but it's, you know, it's it's a slog. But when you see a few things that is, are getting a lot of buzz, you're like, pretty cool. And now I have some firsthand knowledge of it. To not have any firsthand knowledge of it and rely solely on the you know lucky reviewers who get some of the stuff, hey, if there are reviewers that you like and trust, great. But there is a slight thing that's lost by not being there yourself. I think the big thing that we're going to miss will be actually the the kind of ancillary events, the digital experience, Pepcom, that kind of stuff, because that's where we typically see a lot of really kind of strange products that, for whatever reason, have the right combination of factors to go mainstream. You might remember the Happy Fork from a couple of years ago, the haptic feedback fork that vibrates when you're eating too much. Um, you know, we get pitches for stuff like that all the time, and the vast majority of the time we kind of ignore it because it sounds silly. But at CES, you've always had this crazy mix of mainstream media along with, with really specialist tech media. And so everybody there covering stuff, you know, if somebody from a major broadcaster sees something like that and goes, oh, this is cool. They put it on Good Morning America or whatever. Uh, and then suddenly it blows up and becomes a mainstream thing. Um, for those smaller companies, they're going to have a harder time reaching that same level of media because there won't be one place that they can put a product and, and get exposure to, you know, the breadth of that media. Now they're going to have to go back to the old school ways of cold emailing people or calling or sending press releases out. So I think that we'll probably see a little bit less of the kind of cool catchy, weird CES stuff that we've typically seen in the past. And that that is a little bit sad. Yeah. I mean, even though they're going to do showstoppers and digital experience and all of those, uh, it's it's just not as quite capable of the serendipity uh, right. that I think yeah, you have exactly. when, when you're exactly. walking around. And think of the space. finger food we won't have. Oh, I know. We'll have real. to we'll have to buy some uh, Totinos or something <laughs> and make it ourselves. <laughs> all right, That's let's so check bad. out the mailbag, Sarah. Let's do it. Uh, Tim, I'm glad you're on the show today because Matt, a.k.a. Waffleophagus, uh, wrote in about some Apple Car news. We were talking about it at the end of 2020. Reuters had reported, hey, Apple Car news. Sounds like they're working on something, but somewhat hard to say what. Uh, Mike, uh, Matt, rather, says, my mind instantly went to one thing, the Toyota Supra. As gearheads know, Toyota brought back the Supra for the 2020 model year, but they had help. It was created in collaboration with BMW, and if you ask most gearheads, it's 
more BMW than Toyota. But the really interesting thing is it isn't even manufactured by BMW or Toyota, but Magna Stur, who makes a whole host of cars for other manufacturers in Germany, including the Supra, the BMW Z4, the Jaguar, Jaguar I-Place, and E-Pace. So they have a history of manufacturing EVs, also others. Magna Stur also offers R&D capabilities and makes specific parts as well. So it's totally possible for Apple to design a car and then very quickly ramp up production by partnering with somebody like Stur, as opposed to the production hell that Tesla went through. According to the Wikipedia entry for Stur, as of 2018, they were capable of producing over 200,000 cars per year. So while we as technologists know that Apple farms out actual manufacturing, I'd figure it'd be worth noting that major car companies are doing the same thing and therefore it would be possible for Apple to build a car. <laughs> also, Matt says, in conclusion, all that said, I still don't think they'll do it. Yeah, that's definitely a great analysis. And he's absolutely spot on. Uh, Magna is a company that, that not only makes uh, cars for other manufacturers, but makes really high end, really high quality cars from other manufacturers. And if Apple, you know, or, or incredibly particular about what they wanted the car to look like, what they wanted the car to feel like, Magna could absolutely deliver what they wanted and for a cost that really wouldn't be, you know, that much more expensive than, the, than going and opening a factory and doing it themselves without them having to worry about all that overhead, which obviously Apple doesn't want to do. In fact, I've heard rumors in the past, I didn't really put much weight behind them, that Apple was actually looking and considering buying Magna, uh, which would give them an ability to do that really easily. Um, but for sure, if Apple wants to produce an actual car, going to a company like Magna would be for sure the way to do it, without a doubt. But I'm still just not confident that Apple really wants to be building cars. I still think that they're kind of waffling between do we want to make a car or do we want to make an overall entertainment experience much like Google is doing now with Android Automotive. That's what's powering all of Polestar's cars. It's what's powering the, the new XC40 recharge from Volvo. And it's really great. It gives you the full Google experience within your car. Uh, if Apple could bring that to a car, it would be really interesting to see what they do. And it would allow them to kind of put their toe in the water, maybe like they did with Sony before the iPod. Uh, you know, do, do we want to make a, a music player? Uh, getting the feel for things and then ultimately releasing their own iPod and then ultimately the iPhone. Uh, maybe that's how they kind of wade into the uh, the transportation market. Yeah, because because there's the other side of it is dealerships and sales of cars as well. Uh, that even if they use Magna, they they would have to develop all of that themselves if they wanted to make it a car that they were doing, not in partnership. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's that, that's good stuff to think about. And uh, yeah, or like Sony or or the Motorola Rocker. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks everybody who sent us feedback over the holiday break here on DTNS, although we had a lot of shows. Hope you all were able to uh, follow along during our time off. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where you can send questions, comments, or anything that we talk about in the show or anything that you'd like us to talk about in the future. We'd also like to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Chris Benito, John and Becky Johnston, and Gadget Virtuoso. Also, thanks to Tim Stevens. Happy New Year, Tim. So glad to have you back. And where can people keep up with all of your work? Happy New Year, sir. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, you can find uh, my stuff at theroadshow.com. I'm Tim underscore Stevens on Twitter or uh, just Tim Stevens on Instagram. Excellent. Uh, folks, uh, we have new merch for you this year. Uh, I, I'm able to show it off on the video these days. Uh, T-shirts and, oh, and hoodies <laughs> with the DTNS seven-year anniversary logo on it. Uh, you just you have to be at the right level to get them, so double-check that. And if you are at a level to get them, it's either a sticker at one level uh, or a hoodie or a mug or something like that. Uh, you can get a new one every three months as long as you stay a patron. So go check it out, patreon.com slash DTNS. We are live, y'all, Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Happy New Year. We are happy to be back, and we'll be back tomorrow with Chris Ashley. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>